Welcome back or just welcome if you're new here. I'm Brandon Rainese and you have landed on Overland Exposures. Today, I'll be teaching you how I took my $3,000 camera setup and turned it into something that was taking wildlife images on par with cameras that were much, much more expensive. Right after this. <laughs> In the world of wildlife photography, if my camera was a food, it would be compared to like a cheese sandwich. Just bread and cheese, not even grilled. Excuse me, I seem to have got two ends on my cheese sandwich. Everybody else get two ends? Just me. John's camera, on the other hand, it would be more like a prime rib. A prime rib prepared by Salt Bay and served by Mr. Belvedere. Now the other day I had a golden opportunity to photograph the elusive North American Great Grey Owl, which if you're into wildlife or birding you know is an extremely rare opportunity. One of our friends actually flew all the way from West Virginia just for the chance. I arrived just before sunrise, met the guys on location, and John had been photographing this owl for about the past four days or so while I was at work. So he knew the general area that we had to go right to. Now John and Joel were both shooting on Sony A9s, which fire like 20 frames a second, and they both had very expensive lenses. I believe John was using a 400mm f2.8, and I believe that Joel was shooting on a 600mm f4. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, let me just say that they're very, very very expensive. So I was eager to find out how my camera, my cheese sandwich, compared to their prime rib, so to speak. Now the camera that I'm shooting on is the Canon EOS R, which is a great camera. It's a jack of all trades, but master of none. It's got a full frame sensor, 30.3 megapixels, great color rendition, has decent video capabilities, but when it comes to wildlife photography, the EOS R has some very, very real limitations that we're gonna discuss right now. Shooting at eight frames a second might be great for grandma's birthday. I hope this is my last. But when it comes to wildlife and other fast moving objects, it's just not enough compared to the 20 frames a second that my peers are shooting. And while the dual pixel autofocus on the Canons is no slouch, it doesn't have animal eye autofocus on this particular camera. And it kind of struggles against contrasty busy areas like birds in trees. And despite the EOS R being a full frame camera, I actually found it doesn't really excel in low light situations. ISO is usable up to 3200 in video and up to right around 6400 in photo. And when you're shooting during the blue hour or the golden hour when light is limited, that fast shutter speed really, really hinders the camera's ability to capture light. So if you can't counterbalance that with a good ISO, you're not gonna take very sharp photos that are frozen in time. And the dynamic range of the R is nothing to brag about. And to be fair, I wasn't really into wildlife shooting when I bought this camera. I bought it for something totally different. I bought it because it takes great 1080p, has awesome colors, and allows me to take footage that I've shot and drop right into Final Cut Pro, pump out a YouTube video, no problem. Since then, I've gotten into wildlife photography and cinematography. My needs have changed, but I can't really afford to just go out and get another camera. So I've learned some workarounds. Here is a side-by-side -side picture of an owl that John and I took while we were sitting right next to each other at the same time. So we have, generally speaking, the same light conditions and the same angle. Can you tell which one was taken by the $3,000 camera and which one was taken by the $16,000 camera? Which one do you prefer? Here's a few more images to compare, and for the sake of discussion, we will call John's camera, camera A, and my camera, camera B. Hint, none of the in-flight shots of the owl were mine.
Now, the majority of the magic happens when we get into post and editing in Lightroom. But before we even open up Lightroom, we need to start by capturing the best possible image that we can utilizing the tools that we have. And to help you do that, I've come up with some tips that we will discuss right now. Find the light. Big, long, expensive telephoto and prime lenses all have one thing in common, fast glass. They let in a ton of light. So if you want your not-so-fancy F11 to look legit, you're gonna have to find an environment that illuminates your subject in the best light possible. Especially if you're attempting to freeze your subject by ramping up your shutter speed, allowing for less light to come into that camera sensor. A lot of the wildlife activity generally happens at dawn and dusk, right? The blue hours and the golden hours where light is at its most beautiful, but not its most plentiful. So find a location where the light is in your favor. Along with opening up your aperture, this should allow you to ramp up your shutter speed without relying too heavily on your ISO and affording you the ability to freeze that critter in time. Or you could just use an external light source, but that's a whole nother ball of wax. We'll get into some other time. Tip number two. Professional wildlife photographers usually try to isolate their subject by using lots of bokeh or blurred background and foreground. They do this because the critters are usually in bushes, branches, forests, and other busy environments. And to make things worse, they're usually camouflaged, trying to blend themselves in. So isolating the subject using depth of field is something that you will see most professionals aiming for. Having that depth of field separation, isolating the target, really brings the viewer's eyes to what the most important thing is, the animal. The way that this is typically achieved is by shooting with a very open aperture and a very expensive lens on a very expensive full-frame camera. For those of us that are slumming it right around f6.3, this usually means getting kind of close to your subject and making sure that the background is kind of far away from your subject. This should help significantly compress the out-of-focus areas of your image and create that buttery, smooth bokeh that you're after. I find that being on the same plane or elevation as your subject really helps separate them from the background. If your subject is on the ground, get down on the ground. If they're up high, try and find a vantage point to where you're shooting on the same level. What you don't want to do is shoot down on a subject that is on the ground because then your background is right there with them. There's, there's nothing to blur out. They're all just there. I know wildlife doesn't typically cooperate with us in the way that maybe a model would, but there are some tricks that we can do in post to help with all of that. I'm getting there. Tip number three, know your gear's limitations and exploit the ever-loving crap out of its strong points. For me personally, on the EOS R, that meant coming to grips with only being able to shoot eight frames a second and having some low light limitations and a crippled autofocus in low light situations. But for the most part, the autofocus on this camera is actually really great when there's enough light, even on fast moving subjects. The real problem that I encountered, however, was the EVF blackout. If you're not familiar with what EVF blackout is, it's when you have an electronic viewfinder, EVF, and you're taking pictures in rapid succession, there is a brief moment of black screen, complete blackness before it takes the next picture and acquires the target again. This means that the image that I'm seeing through the viewfinder is actually like a stuttered, delayed picture representing what I'm seeing in front of it. It's not like an optical, real-time viewfinder. It's not like a better EVF found on the Sony A9s where there's no blackout. This makes it extremely difficult for me to track a moving subject and to be able to anticipate where it's going to be moving. Instead of even trying to attempt capturing an owl in flight in low light situations with my camera, I chose to take advantage of my time by preparing for the owl to be stationary in well-lit areas with backgrounds and separation. Tip number four, timing. Maybe you don't have the luxury of 20 frames a second spraying and praying and then picking through a thousand images for the best one later. Maybe you only have a single shot at a time. Maybe you're shooting on an old vintage film camera. You get one chance. Be especially opportunistic when it comes to pulling the trigger. Think back to the days of film photography when you had one single opportunity, one snap, to get that wildlife shot of a dream. And they would have given anything for eight frames a second. So I really have no room to complain. 
Which brings me to my fifth and final tip before we jump into the edit. Be patient, and I think this is actually the most important tip. Just be patient. I'm not good at it. Maybe you are. Maybe you're going to be an awesome wildlife photographer because you are patient. I'm learning. Take the time to make multiple trips out to the location. Study the landscape. Look for areas of good lighting where opportunities might present themselves. Learn what animals are where, what time of the day, what the weather conditions are like, when the sun comes up, when it goes down. Record all of this. Take notes. Learn the animal's routine, and based on that animal's routine, choose a location that best serves your camera's capabilities and best serves your composition. Sure, your buddies with the $16,000 camera setup might get the occasional banger by walking willy-nilly through the forest, but I guarantee you that since they've invested so much money into their equipment, they're not just tromping around through the forest hoping that a Nat Geo-worthy cover shot's going to present itself magically in front of them. They're taking the time, they're doing the research, they're putting in the legwork. Be patient. Okay, that's enough jibber-jabber for now. Let's jump on into Lightroom. I'll show you guys how I fake it till I make it. Okay, we have opened up an image. It's a raw file that I took. This is the one that I took when I was sitting right next to John. So I compared my image with his and I tried to get mine to look as close to his as I possibly could. And on this, I was using my 70 to 200 at 200 millimeters. So he was using his 400 and I think he had a times two or 1.4 extender on any. Anyway, he was able to get a lot closer than I was. So we're gonna have to first things first, crop in on this image. Yeah, okay, that'll work. Uh, I'm actually kind of happy with the exposure on this already. I'm going to take down the contrast though. And by doing this, it should help me kind of achieve more of that soft bokeh look. Take it down to about 81. The highlights, they're pretty bright up in the top area here, so we can go ahead and take that down just a little bit. Yeah, yeah I'm happy with that. The shadows, as you can see, there is quite a bit of shadows happening here. We're gonna go ahead and lift some of that. It's also gonna bring up our exposure slightly. By dropping the contrast, this actually kind of takes the edge, the sharpness off the image, makes it look a little bit softer, helps bloom those highlights out a little bit, and overall kind of gives it a little bit better feel, I think. Now because this owl has quite a bit of white on it, I want those to pop. And generally when I edit my photos, they're typically just for like Instagram and social media in general. So I want that animal to really pop. And I do that by making the white a little bit whiter. Conversely, I'm gonna make the blacks a little bit blacker. Lastly, I like to give it a little bit of an S curve. I'm gonna do that by lifting the shadows a little bit, coming down in here, crush the blacks and lift the highlights. Maybe drop that down just a little there. Might be a little too dark. Moving right along into the colors. As you can tell, this image is actually very, very warm. So, in order to achieve that warmth, we're gonna have to raise the temperature. Next, we're gonna bring in a little bit of green here by just moving that tint Ever so slightly towards the green. Vibrance, I actually like to take down the vibrance. I feel like it makes the image just a little bit softer. Saturation, I'll take the saturation down just a little bit as well. Jumping into our hue, saturation, and luminance. Gonna start off with the hue here, and in the red palette we will Go ahead and bring that more towards the orange. About 43. The orange we are going to shift yellow by about 21. Yellow, we're shifting orange quite a bit. And we're not doing anything to the rest. 
So now we'll go back into our saturation. Red, we're going to bring up to about 49. Orange, plus 39. Remember, this is all subjective. You can edit however you want. This is just how I did this particular photo. Yellow, we're going to pop up there quite a bit. Greens, we're actually going to take the saturation on the green down just a little bit, maybe like right around negative nine. And moving on to the luminance, orange, we are going to take down to about negative 13 or so. Eh, call that good, negative 14. Yellow, we are actually going to pump up into the 60s. And the same with the greens. That about does it for the colors. Just going to give it a slight bit of texture. Just a little bit. Clarity, I'm not going to mess with the clarity on this portion because what I'm eventually going to do is going to bring a brush in around the subject and try and clean up the background, make it look a little bit softer, get rid of some of the noise. So I don't want to affect the overall image by increasing the clarity. In fact, I just want to increase the clarity on the owl, which I will. I'll show you that in a minute too. The haze plus two ish vignette. Now I like to use a vignette on a lot of my stuff. I think it helps attract the attention to the subject, helps bring in the eye. So I like to put a little vignette on some of my stuff, but that's completely up to you. If you don't like it, if you hate vignette, don't do a vignette. That's just kind of where I'm at. Grain. I think I have enough grain in this photo already. I don't need to touch that. Sharpening, I'm just going to leave at plus 40. That's kind of the auto default go-to. I'm fine with that for now. I will remove the chromatic aberration and enable the lens correction. Okie dokie. Now I'm going to select my brush tool and I am actually going to go in and paint everything except for the owl. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the clarity once we have all of that painted in. And you'll see I'm not going to paint some of the branches because I want some of the things to remain in focus. I don't want it to look too unrealistic. I'm not bringing it right up to the owl either. I want that edge to be a little harsh so that way it kind of pops against the background. And this is just kind of a quick down and dirty. This isn't like my final edit, but you get the idea. There you can see we have the very vast majority highlighted except for the owl. And now what we're going to do is take that clarity down. We're going to take it way down. We're going to take it down to like, I don't know, like 90. And you can see how that just, that noise just completely went away. We still kept the details like on the feathers on the side of his face there, but that whole background just got immediately softer. What else are we gonna do to this? Next, we're gonna open up the details tab and we're gonna take our noise down right around like negative 88 or so, somewhere, we'll call it negative 90. Sharpness, same thing, we're gonna crush that bugger too. We're taking that like 100%, what the heck, why not? We want it super creamy, right? That's what we're doing. Boom, fake bokeh. Psh. See how much better that already looks, I think, in my opinion. It's my opinion, I can have an opinion. Now we're gonna go ahead and paint the owl and we're gonna increase the contrast, make some of his colors pop a little bit more, maybe increase the exposure, especially around the face area. Good enough for the purpose of this. Again, I'm gonna bring the contrast down to about negative 47 or so. And we are going to increase some of the highlights, bring out some of the light on the feathers. Bring 
the shadows up just a hair. Increase the whites again by about plus 45. And decrease the blacks. I actually think that he looks a little bit noisy and a little bit harsh, so again I'll be taking down the clarity just on the owl this time. Increase the sharpness, make his feathers and plumage pop a little bit. Now I'm going to be increasing the sharpness only on the owl. Hopefully this will bring out some of the detail in the feathers. I actually want to help separate this owl from the background a little bit more. So I'm going to overall increase his exposure just a little bit. I think that looks pretty good. If you look closely around the edge of the owl where we used our brush tool, you zoom in, you can definitely see that there's still some of the grainy background hanging out back there. But when you zoom out, you can't really see it. So I'm not too worried about that right now. And there's some other spots here, but if I wanted to spend more time actually really getting in and around those branches and stuff like that, we could definitely do that. But I don't feel like it right now. The last thing I'm gonna do is go over to my brushes again. I'm gonna grab the circle. We're gonna highlight the owl's eye. And for the sake of social media posts, a lot of the times I really like to make their eyes extremely visible. Something where if I'm scrolling through a feed and I see an animal's eye, especially that big yellow owl eye, I really want that to stand out and draw viewers in. So I'm going to highlight it a little bit and maybe increase the saturation and exposure. There you go. And that is how you take a $3,000 camera setup and try and replicate something that is far superior. And I think we've done a really good job. I love how soft the background is now. I love how the owl pops into the foreground and how his eye is super bright now. I think overall, this image, when compared to the one that John took sitting right next to me, pretty dang close. Again. It's subjective, it's all preference. Which one do you prefer? Special thanks to John, Sean, Josh, and Joel for hanging out with me, teaching me some of the tricks of the trade and uh, for letting me use some of their gear. I will be linking all of their Instagrams down below in the description, so be sure and go check out some of the photos that they took. They will blow your mind. Thanks again so much for tuning in. I hope you learned something I did, I always do. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe and we will see you on the next adventure.